So now that we've talked a bit about what a future is, let's see how they actually can be used in practice. So we're going to first start by visualizing Java futures, and then we're going to take a look at how to program them in more detail. So basically what happens with futures is when you invoke an operation, when you submit something that involves futures, the call, the thing that's called, the callee returns the future right away, continues to run the computation in the background thread, and the caller will do something with the future it receives in response to making the asynchronous call. So here's a simple example that we're going to visualize. This is the submit method on the executor service. Actually, more, more specifically, the abstract executor service, but it's OK. You can think of it like submit on executor service, which can initiate an asynchronous call on Java. So a submit call is made on the executor service. An executor service is basically a pool of threads you can implement different ways. And you can implement it either with a fixed pool of threads, like we show here. You can also implement it with a variable size pool of threads. We're going to just use a fixed size of th thread pool here. So we have a, four threads, just to make it easy. So when you submit a task, you can do it typically in a two-way-like manner, two-way asynchronous manner. You submit the task. The task is an instance of callable. So here's an example of how to do that. Here's a task that uses a callable lambda, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So this is the task. This is a callable that will basically multiply two big fractions and return a big fraction result. We make an instance of the task. We submit the task. The task is now given to the executor service. And what we get back here, as you can see, is we get back a future to a big fraction, which will be the result of doing this stuff in the background. So this is what actually gets run in the background. This is the computation. This is the, the business logic of the task. You can see it takes, makes two big fractions from two strings, and then it multiplies them together. And that multiplication will be done asynchronously in a thread in this fixed size thread pool. When the asynchronous call completes, the future will be triggered. In other words, the result will be given to it. And that means that anybody who wants to obtain that result can get it without further blocking. So at some point, and this is the tricky part, of course, the client calls get on that uh, future, the big fraction future. And if it's finished, it'll get it a result. If it's not finished, it'll block. And there's ways of bounding the amount of time needed to block. So you can block either indefinitely or until things fail. You can also use a timed result. So in this case, we could say, future.get n in seconds, or n in milliseconds, or n in microseconds, and so on and so forth. So there's ways to bound the amount of time that you spend. If you give a zero here, then that means poll. It means check to see if it's done. And if it's not done, return right away and go off and do something else. Now, remember the point I made before. Because we're running all these things in the background asynchronously, the order in which they're called may, in fact, not be the order in which they complete which may be a problem, may not be a problem. It all depends on what you're trying to do. So that's a quick visualization of Java futures. Now we're going to talk about how to program futures. Now that we talked about visualizing futures, let's discuss how to program them. And we'll show a fun example that's kind of riffing off of what we talked about before. And this will show you how to multiply big fraction objects concurrently and asynchronously using Java futures. We're going to use this in the context of our big fraction class. I think we've talked about this before when we talked about the fork join pool, and I showed an example of big fractions. It's basically just an arbitrary precision fraction that uses big integers for the numerator and denominator, which can grow to arbitrarily large numbers. You have some factor methods that create so-called reduced fractions, where it reduces them to their simplest form. You can also create non-reduced fractions and then later reduce them, which you might want to do in some background thread, because reduction could take a while. You can perform arbitrary precision fraction arithmetic, which will do various things. And then you can also take a so-called mixed fraction. You can create a mixed fraction from a so-called improper fraction. So 18 fourths is 4 and a half. These are all things you probably learned when you were in like fourth grade or something like that. So let's talk about how to, how to program this. So we're going to show this using a Java future with a callable and the common fork join pool. So here's the example. You can find the example in the EX8 folder in the Java 8 uh, repository in my live lessons account. So we have a callable, which is a two-way task that returns a result. 
with a single method that does not take any arguments, although you'll see how you can pass it arguments by using essentially effectively final variables. So that's what a callable is. You can have this initialized with a so-called supplier lambda, or really a callable lambda in this case. So this is a lambda that is going to create the two big fraction objects. And you can see here how they use the string variables that are outside the scope of the task to initialize the lambda contents inside of the task. And this is what's called an effectively final variable. So it just means that it's not set, it's not changed after it's initially set. Once we've got ourselves this big fraction callable, we then submit it to the common fork join pool, and that will then run it in the background. We get back a future, and that future then can be used to obtain the result at some point. And the key thing here is the dot, 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 which means that there could be other code, there should be other code, there's hopefully other code between the submit and the get. If there's not other code here, then we've completely wasted time by doing things asynchronously because it's just turning around and blocking immediately. This get call will block until things either complete successfully or unsuccessfully, and then the results, either success or an exception, will be retrieved. You can also do polling and timed waits if you so desire. As we will see later, it's almost always a bad idea to do timed operations. You're much better off doing something else, and we'll talk about the something else later. So that is a quick overview of how to apply Java futures in practice.